All right, Acoustic Pants here, and this video is in a series in answer to questions posted by a guy called Kung Fu Simon on uh, Reddit in the in the Christianity subreddit. Yeah, our uh, Christianity. There you go. And his his question was, why is biblical prophecy so confusing? Basically, states how it's all over the place. And I'm attempting to answer the five questions he asked. Uh, so for this particular question, you need to have heard the video before it about the book of Revelation, but I'll just, I'll just dive straight in. So Kung Fu Simon's second question uh, to quote was, John was supposedly in the future at Patmos Island, but he saw the dragon corrupting one third of the angels, which is supposedly in the past. And the dragon coming to earth again is supposedly in the future again question mark and that's the whole question uh, so I, I assume Simon Kung Fu you are asking how is this possible or how does this work well so the book of Revelation is not necessarily a chronological account of of events it's a series of visions there's uh, it should be six or seven visions that John has he receives from God and it's that they all start of uh, like it, it reads as though if you're not paying attention it reads as though it's just a straight up timeline but it's not it'll he'll, he'll always start his visions with then i saw uh then i witnessed then the spirit took me to and so there's a couple of different visions now the particular thing you're talking about should be revelation 12. yeah yeah with the dragon so he's just had one particular vision or oracle about the two witnesses in chapter 11. No, I think that I think chapter 11 is still part of what happens in chapter 10 really, but but that's a topic for another day. And then he starts then he's given a new oracle, right? You're only reading them in the order John wrote them down. Uh, and and possibly you're reading them in the order he was given the visions as well. Uh, that's not necessarily to be understood as as a foretelling of the future where the way they're written is the way it plays out along the space-time continuum but and but anyhow like be that as it may we'll just talk about this chapter briefly the uh the, as i've mentioned before the books of the bible are, are mixes of different genres so you'll have like this book alone has poetry and songs and then prophecy apocalyptic and letters in it uh and, and that's all mixed together it's like if you if you were some kind of like camping guru or survival out in the wilderness guru like Bear Grylls say you made like a, a book about all the different stuff you'd probably have a few different things in there so you might have maps you might have stories of your survival you might have interviews or stories of other people's survival you might have glossaries you might have first aid cures or recipes you might have cooking recipes and then you probably also have like hunting and fishing and tracking techniques in there you might even have a picture guide of different knots um, or different types of rudimentary shelters you can build so this book of your camping and survival in the wilderness would have all these different genres communicating different types of information but the book would probably not explain those genres to you or you wouldn't need to explain it people reading your book would understand what what your guide of knots was doing and they wouldn't read the guide of knots in the same way that they would interpret the maps and they wouldn't interpret the maps in the same way you use the glossaries and that would just be understood by the audience so the bible is is the same right it's full of all this stuff which we're not privy to because it wasn't written primarily to us today uh, john's apocalypse revelation has its own has its own intended audience and we want to know about that audience and we want to know what his intent was and we want to understand the genre so before you before you interpret anything or before you try to figure out what happened in the past or the future of the dragon did this and then that how does that work you kind of want to understand the genre the author and the audience and that, and that goes for all historical sources not just parts of the bible so you'd have I've already mentioned you've got you know bits of letters, prophecies, songs in in the book of Revelation. There's also 
what what this book is mainly made up of a type of literature called apocalyptic writing or apocalyptic literature it's its own genre uh, it was really popular in the 200 years before and after Jesus time during that Greco-Roman period and it doesn't exist anymore uh, at all we've got uh, or historians I should say have lots of uh, manuscripts and references to apocalyptic writings outside Jewish and Christian sources as well uh, all over the Greco-Roman world and they're characterized by things like like stuff in this book like there's beasts and there's harlots and witches and dragons and uh, mystic creatures and, and visions from on high and uh, gods and prophecies and sufferings and joys and spiritual cosmic warfares and all of these kinds of kinds of symbols and imagery you find in the book of Revelation. Generally, the big thing about the apocalyptic genre is that it's not... Like, biblical prophecy is quite different to a lot of other prophecy in, in pagan traditions. It's not about foretelling the future. It's about the prophet receiving an insight from God for God's people at the current time. So, and the apocalyptic genre for John and for lots of other uh, records in other religions is also about their current time. They're not trying to foretell the future. So what you're looking at, what you might see as a foretelling of the future or a map uh, of, of events on a timeline is really John trying to make a commentary on his current circumstances or, or on the church's current circumstances. So with the timing of the dragon, You've got a third of the stars being knocked out of the sky, representing the angels that he deceived, uh, as the tradition goes. And then he comes back to Earth, and then, and then there's a war. How does it go? First part of the chapter, the dragon tries to devour the baby the woman gives birth to. Then there's war in heaven. No, wait, sorry, I skipped a bit. Yeah. Then he, then he, then he sweeps away a third of the stars. Uh, yada yada yada. I'm just trying to paraphrase here. Then there's war in heaven in verse 7. Michael and his angels fight against the dragon and his angels. The dragon loses. And then the dragon's forced out of heaven. That's right. And then and then he's thrown down to earth with all his angels. So that there is, is a reference to the legendary fall of Satan where he's kicked out of heaven, the heavenly realm, and he's relegated to the earthly realm for the humans to deal with, presumably. And then there's a song, a loud voice shouts across the heavens. And then verse 13, when the dragon realizes he'd been thrown down to the earth, he pursued the woman who had given birth to the male child. And then, the dragon tried, yep, and then there's the flood. And then, and then the dragon was angry at the woman, declared war against the rest of her children, the people of God. And that's the end of the chapter. And then it goes on about the beast from the sea and the earth and, and so on and so forth. Right. Uh, I really love the book of Revelation. I find it fascinating. This and Proverbs are my two favorite books of the Bible. I know I'm meant to say like the Gospels or something romantic like that, but no, it's this book and Proverbs. So, with the timing, how can I put it? The, the first thing I want to say about Satan and dragons and the idea of angels and demons fighting each other uh, is that this idea developed over a really long time, like a really long time. So I don't know if you've noticed, but in the Garden of Eden, there's a serpent as well. Like dragons are uh, sometimes also called serpents. You know, big magical serpents with wings, but still serpents. In the Garden of Eden, the serpent is, as far as we can tell, just a snake. Uh, and certainly the earliest... The earliest views of this serpent was that it was just some kind of mischievous creature in the Garden of Eden. And over time, as, as ideas about who Satan was developed, Jews and then Christians, I suppose, started to read the book of Genesis and read the garden story and go, oh, this serpent must have been Satan all along. But that wasn't the original, original view, as far as can be told. Um, dragons are a pretty common a pretty common subject, a pretty common agent within apocalyptic literature. They've all got their dragons and their scary beasts. Uh, Satan, the word, 
comes from the old Hebrew word hasatan, which literally just means the enemy or the adversary. And that doesn't and that doesn't mean enemy in an individual sense. So we today, no, excuse me. Let me hot chocolate. Mm. Mm. Ah, tasty. So we today use the word Satan as though it applies to a um, an individual of immense spiritual power, and you know seems to rule the world with his dark, sinful powers from behind the shadows, kind of thing. But the word Hasatan, and even Satan in English really, refers to enemy in general, or in corporate. So, for example, if you're a soldier, uh, and, and your platoon goes on patrol one day, and you see the enemy on three different occasions, when you report back to your commanding officer, you might say you saw the enemy, but on each three different occasions it was different people. Like the first time might have just been a scout in a tree, the second time you saw the enemy might have been another platoon of enemy soldiers, and then the third time you saw the enemy you might have found a camp of thousands of soldiers, right? So it's it's not about an individual, it's just a, it's a statement of status, not about individuality or personhood or, or numbers. So that, that's an important thing to understand, it was a long time before the Hebrew understanding of Hasatan, the enemy, the spiritual force against God's people, was given an individual, or was given to be an individual. There was, it was just understood that there were evil spirits at work to make life hard for God's people. Uh, but during the Persian era, the the see the Persians. All right, so so you'll know possibly of the story. In the book of Daniel, actually, you've got a bit, one of your questions is about the book of Daniel, Kung Fu Simon. So in that book, that depicts part of the time where the Jews were exiled to Babylon. And then, while, while the Jews were exiled in Babylon, the Persian Empire came to power, overtook the Babylonians, and then they ruled for a long time. And then, under the Persian Empire, uh, it was, was it Darius or Cyrus? What, uh, I'm pretty sure it was Darius. Uh, let them go back home and rebuild their land and that's how you get the stories of Ezra and Nehemiah chronicles and whatnot. Uh, <clears throat> in Persian mythology, there are two gods. There's Ormaz, the good god, and there's Ahriman, the evil god. Uh, and they're constantly at war with one another in the spiritual realm and they have their own forces of good and evil. They have their own spiritual agents, what we would call agents, what we would call angels and demons. Uh, forget the name they have for their spirits uh, but but there's this constant cosmic war and they're roughly equal in power and constantly vying for it and at different times in history things are going good that means all Mars is winning if things are going bad that generally means Ariman's winning so this idea as it, as it applies to Judaism and then Christianity is this idea of of Hasatan of Satan becoming an individual an incredibly powerful evil angel in charge of a massive force of his own evil angels at war with God's people and with God. And that's basically the inspiration for this story. Now the dragon, um, yeah, okay. Where do I start with that? Before I talk about the dragon, I guess, I guess I should start at the start of that chapter with the woman and and the you know the sun and the stars giving birth to the child. This idea of God versus Satan uh, still it still exists a lot in the church today. Like so, Kung Fu Simon. I don't know what your background is, uh, but for for many people there is this idea of a, of a spiritual war. Uh, it's just that in the Judeo Christian traditions, God ultimately wins, whereas in the Persian tradition. There's just constant warfare without any, or seemingly without any resolution. It will just go on to time immemorial, till eventually maybe one will eventually crush the other so bad, and then the world will be shrouded in darkness or bathed in light forevermore or whatever. But uh, the dragon, yes. We'll start with the woman before we talk about the dragon. So she's got, she's got. She's he saw a woman clothed with the sun, the moon beneath her feet and a crown of 12 stars on her head. She was pregnant. She cried out because of her labor pains and the agony of giving birth. Uh, so some commentators, and I, I would almost include myself in this, 
regard this as a throwback to Babylonian yes. mythology. So this woman's likely some kind of sun goddess and the stars... Um, is it 12 stars or 12 crowns? Forgive me. She has a crown of 12 stars on her head. I mean, so so in, in the Jewish tradition, the 12 stars would be the 12 tribes of Israel or the 12 sons of Jacob. In the Christian tradition, it could be that in addition to the 12 apostles of Jesus. Um, but, but either way, so this and the child is often seen to be Jesus. Um, but in different, in different traditions, there's often um, some blessed hero come to save humanity born of some woman in some special spiritual circumstance and there's some dragon or some beast or some enemy ready to destroy the child as it's born. Um, so I think the author John here is just taking this idea, this concept and applying it to this story of, to this story that he's trying to tell in Revelation. Cloak of the sun, 12 stars. You could also say, I guess, the woman is um, Mary. I think that's pretty, a pretty reasonable kind of uh, interpretation or, or transposition of, of, of her identity. I don't think the point is to come up with an identity. Um, like with the idealist view, the author, if you like the idealist view, you might say the author is just trying to say that Satan tried to destroy Jesus on his way to Earth, uh, however he could. Uh, what else is there? Yeah, I suppose... The dragon. He's got seven heads, ten horns, seven crowns on each of his heads. Right. So, finally. The the, the, the idea of a dragon, or sometimes in Jewish, Jewish mythology, could be called the Leviathan. You read about that in Psalms and Job. Um, in Babylonian creation myths, the the dragon... Oh, is sometimes also called the sky goddess Tiamat whom their chief god Marduk defeated to create the earth and he cut her body in half and with one half he made the sky and with the bottom half he made the earth and, and so on so like the the story goes that at the beginning of the world the dragon was slain to begin it so to end this age the dragon needs to be slain again or it needs to be reborn or you know something like that and I, th I think John is kind of appropriating that to this story. And he's kind of making Satan the dragon in this mythology. Like he's, he's almost creating his own mythology, you could, you could say. Uh, it's got seven crowns, seven heads, ten horns. Um, I'm not sure how well you know your Greek history here. But in this, around the time this was written, right before the Roman period, uh, there was a Greek kingdom ruling over Israel and, and Syria and that part of the Near East. And this particular kingdom had a line of 10 kings, a particular line of 10 particular kings, ending with a guy called, it should be Antiochus IV, I believe. Yeah, Antiochus IV. Um, and he was, he, I mean, he did a lot of things uh, which angered the Jews, persecuted them, tried to, you know, convert them all to Greek, to, to Greek religions and Greek, Greek, uh, religious practices and so Orthodox Jews tended to really hate him uh, as far as Rome goes it was a city built on seven hills famously so sometimes this could be there, there is another reference later on about a city on seven hills Jerusalem was also built on seven hills coincidentally uh, so it could be that the dragon with the, the seven heads reference is is a reference to the seven hills the city is built on my blades will do the talking uh, <clears throat> yeah, there's there's lots of other ways that gets interpreted, but if you, given given John's time in history, I think that's probably more likely what he's trying to say. He's referencing Rome as the dragon, as the enemy, as the oppressor, uh, trying to destroy the child and then waging war against God's people. Because at this time, uh, the Christians were being persecuted across the Roman Empire, across the Roman Empire. Excuse me. And that's the other big thing about these uh, apocalyptic texts is... I know I mentioned this before, I'm sorry. But they're often... Um, they're often written as a way of saying hold out against the persecution and their, and their criticisms of the current oppressive government. And uh, 
that's that's a very common theme amongst the different people groups and the different types and religions of, of apocalyptic literature you could also say some commentators have said that this is part of John's worldview as to why Christians suffer or as to why there is suffering in the world uh, and this is a whole other topic which it's a deep rabbit hole the question of suffering the problem of evil in the world it's an interesting one but you, you could also argue that John is saying the reason that Christians in particular suffer is because of Satan making the world horrible for them you know and that's an interesting an interesting take on things could be right could be wrong um, and he may or may not have had that view he might have just thought it was a um, he might not be making any comment on why the world is the way it is but he might have been and that's that's an interesting idea so anyway that's that's that question your question of why is the dragon in the past and then it seems to be in the future and John had his vision um, how does the whole timeline of the of this part, particular part of Revelation work I hope that gives you some insight. I may have just raised even more questions. Um, really sorry to do that to you. Christianity and, and the Bible tends to do that. It's not it's not black and white as we'd like it to be. Anyhow, your next question was, The dead will apparently be raised to heaven after the trumpet call of Michael, but I thought Jesus took them up from Sheol ever since the cross. Indeed, it seems like Enoch, Elijah, and Moses were in heaven even before the cross, especially Enoch and Elijah. It was written that God took them up. So again, you haven't haven't really summated your question, but I know exactly what you mean, and I will talk about that in my next video. I've come to collect. Is that a broken twig, I spy? Your bottom tower is under attack. Dyer's structures are fortified. Your bottom tower is under attack. With the effort. Found Your you. bottom tower has fallen. I think chapter 11 is still part of what happens in chapter 10 really but but that's a topic for another day and then he starts then he's given a new oracle right you're only reading them in the order John wrote them down uh, and and possibly you're reading them in the order he was given the visions as well uh, that's not necessarily to be understood as as a foretelling of the future where the way they're written is the way it plays out along the space-time continuum but and but anyhow like be that as it may we'll just talk about this chapter briefly the uh the, as i've mentioned before the books of the bible are, are mixes of different all right acoustic pants here and this video is in a series in answer to questions posted by a guy called kung fu simon on uh, reddit in the in the christianity subreddit yeah our christianity there you go and his his question was why is biblical prophecy so confusing basically states how it's all over the place and i'm attempting to answer the five questions he asked uh, so for this particular question you need to have heard the video before it about the book of revelation but i'll just i'll just dive straight in so kung fu simon's second question sees from god and it's that they all start of five enemies, five uh, like it, it reads as though if you're not paying attention it reads as though it's just a straight up timeline but it's not it'll he'll, he'll always start his visions with then i saw uh then i witnessed then the spirit took me to and so there's a couple of different visions now the particular thing you're talking about should be revelation 12. yeah yeah with the dragon so he's just had one particular vision or oracle about the two witnesses in chapter 11. No, I think that, uh, to quote was, 
John was supposedly in the future at Patmos Island, but he saw the dragon corrupting one third of the angels which is supposedly in the past, and the dragon coming to earth again is supposedly in the future again. Question mark. And that's the whole question. Uh, so I, I assume, Simon, Kung Fu, you are asking how is this possible, or how does this work? Well, so the book of Revelation is not necessarily a chronological account of of events. It's a series of visions. There's uh, it should be six or seven visions that John has. Who different genres? So you'll have like this book alone has poetry and songs and then prophecy, apocalyptic and letters in it, uh, and and that's all mixed together. It's like if you if you were some kind of like camping guru or survival out in the wilderness guru like Bear Grylls say you made like a, a book about all the different stuff you'd probably have a few different things in there so you might have maps you might have stories of your survival you might have interviews or stories of other people's survival you might have glossaries you might have first aid cures or 